Hello, friends. Welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. I am John Lomakang, and we are in a lesson study that's really very, very practical. You know, oftentimes in life, we face our crucibles, our melting pot, our fiery furnace, our lion's den. And we're going to talk about that today. What happens when you face the crucibles? And I, I like the lesson theme in the crucible with Christ. When you are a Christian, you are never by yourself. Well, Amen. We have an exciting study today and my family is ready and waiting. And I think that Shelly Quinn is going to be the first out of the shoot. How are you doing, Shelly? I'm doing great. And I'm going to be speaking about the crucibles of Satan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's Ooh. going to be deep. Mm -hmm. And Jill, good to have you here. What's your title today? Thank you, Pastor John. The Crucibles of Sin. Ooh, wow. Mm -hmm. Ryan. All right, I have Crucibles of Purification. <laughs> I can't wait. And James. Crucibles of maturity. Mm. Wow. I think that you might get it by now. We're talking about crucibles. Can I safely say that? <laughs> wow. Well, before we go into our lesson study, thank you for your prayers and support of this network. But before we open God's word, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. James, would you have a prayer for us? Sure. Father, again, we just want to thank you for each viewer that's tuned in. We want to thank you for the opportunity we have to open your word. And we want to pray that Please send the Holy Spirit yeah. to tune in with us, to direct us, to strengthen us, to encourage us as we study this important lesson on crucibles. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Wow. Amen. You know, the lesson, the person that constructed the lesson, uh, the author of this lesson has done an amazing job to just distill something down to practical Christianity. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, practical Christianity uh, somebody once said to me, actually not too long ago, they said, well, you know, you talk about revelation and prophecy quite a bit, but you haven't been doing that lately. And I said to them, because I've discovered that we don't falter in prophecy and end time topics, we falter in practical Christianity. Mm -hmm. And I think this yeah. lesson is bringing that out because these are the places that we often fail. Mm -hmm. When we pass the fulcrum point in our experiences and we can't pull it back, mm -hmm. when we lean, lean too far forward and we cannot recover ourselves, when trials come that seem to overwhelm our scales of life, we face crucibles. Mm -hmm. And that's why this lesson is so important and practical. Matter of fact, the uh, theme scripture for this particular lesson is 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. And Peter, who better to write a passage mm -hmm. like this than somebody who had mm -hmm. to face his own crucible with Christ? Mm -hmm. Beloved, he says, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. Notice that's a certainty, mm -hmm. as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. The uh, author of the lesson talks about the, chemical, the, the chemistry lab. I don't know if any of you remember chemistry mm -hmm. lab. When I first went into chemistry lab in high school, it was exciting because it had an unusual odor. Didn't know whether it was a <laughs> chemical or something that was burning or, and we even got to the point once where we, they brought a little, little small, uh, animal to kind of expose some of us to the thought that maybe we might want to be in the medical field and surgeon and we dissected it and it was just the most awful smelling thing. <laughs> but in those labs you have strange kinds of experiments and the writer of the lesson brings us out in the story that he says um, in chemistry labs one often places various materials into a small container and heats them to extreme temperatures. As the container becomes hotter the material either melt, mm -hmm. fizzle, spit, or burn brightly, yeah. depending on what they are made of. Mm. The container is called crucible. You know, each of us, mm. something happens maybe differently in each of us. That's why when you go through something in your life and you see how it has molded you or shaped you or formed you, then you are able to help somebody else going through the very same crucible. And I learned something, Oswald Chambers, one of my favorite um, devotional writers, he said, when God, is, when God is refining someone, the worst thing we can do as Christians is step in between that person and God, mm -hmm. thinking that by, by being sympathetic, we're helping them. 
we prevent them from being refined. If we, in, if we step between God's refinement and the person who needs to be refined, it's like throwing cold water in a tube in a chemistry lab. Mm -hmm. It'll never become what it's supposed to become. And the dictionary defines the crucible this way in three different ways. A vessel used for melting a substance that requires a high degree of heat. Mm -hmm. Ooh, sounds like gold tried on the fire. What do you think, mm -hmm. Shelley? Secondly, a severe test. The gold tried, severe test. Thirdly, a place or situation in which concentrated forces interact to cause or influence change or development. Wow, that sounds like something you use on Tuesdays, those satanic crucibles, yeah. where, where concentrated forces between light and darkness, good and evil, they interact to cause or influence change or development. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it is not until we face difficulty that we become what God always intended for us to be. Mm -hmm. Paul the apostle talked about those who don't respond to the voice of God and he said, commit such a one to Satan that they may be buffeted, mm -hmm. that in the end they, their flesh may be saved. So sometimes God says to us, like he said to Peter, the devil desires to sift you as wheat, but I pray that your faith will not fail. And it's after that sifting, he says things like this to us. When you're converted, strengthen the brethren. Mm -hmm. God does not always intervene in our crucibles, but he never leaves us in our crucibles. Praise God for mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. What are the surprises? Crucibles are sometimes appointed. Mm -hmm. That's why Peter said, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. Trials are a part and parcel with the Christian life. Trials are not, not always co coincidental. Sometimes they are allowed by God. Other times they are designed by God. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. God sometimes allows it. Sometimes God designs it. Now, I found that in the crucibles, I found three very important things. Let's go to Romans 8, verse 17. Talk about how God is with us in the crucibles that we face. Okay, Romans 8, verse 17. Uh, Jill, do you have that? I do. This is one, this one talks about sharing in Christ's crucible. Romans 8, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. That's right. That's the suffering with Christ. The Hebrews faced the fiery furnace with Christ. They would not have known that Christ was with them so directly, the Son of God with them, until they stepped in the fire. And those who put them in the crucible saw one like the Son of Man. There are those people that may think that they are extinguishing your faith when in fact they're simply igniting your faith by mm -hmm. putting you in the fire. Mm -hmm. The faith of the Hebrews were ignited, not extinguished, not burned up, not destroyed. Sometimes God allows us to be put into the places where our faith will shine even brighter than it did apart from the flames. The other one is John 16, 33, the crucible of certainty. John 16, 33, who can get that and read that for us? John 16, 33, mm -hmm. the crucible of certainty. You have that, Ryan? Yes, I do. John chapter 16, verse 33 says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Yeah, the, cru the crucible of certainty. We're going to have it. Some people, when they become Christians, they wonder, Man, I just gave my life to the Lord. Why am I going through this? Hey, it is, it is the trial, the battle doesn't begin until you give your life to the Lord because you are at an intersection. You've just turned away from your old way. Now you're beginning to learn a new way. And as one person once said, all the miles you travel going away from God, you got to travel coming back. Mm -hmm. And he refines you in the return That's right. journey. <laughs> he refines you on the way back. And it's not an easy refinement, but it's a worthy refinement. Yes. The other one is the crucible of satanic attack. And Jill, I'll have you read this one since that's here. Revelation 2 and verse 10, the crucible of satanic attacks. This is Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. You have that? Do not fear any of these things which are about, you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Notice there's a cadence. Mm. The trials are coming. But if you suffer with me, you're going to be glorified with me. The trials are coming. The tribulations are coming. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. It's going to be difficult, but be thou faithful unto death and I'll give you a crown of life. There's always a reward 
at the end of the test. If we endure through it, then we become what God intends for us to be. And Jesus, and I love this in Hebrews 12, 1, he says, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. I, I made this statement in one of my recent sermons. The cross was not the destiny. The cross was a stop along the way to the That's destiny. Good. That's good. What was the destiny for the joy that was set before him? Mm -hmm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to endure the cross. I'm going to despise the shame because after this, I'm going to be able to sit down at the right hand with my father on his throne. Mm -hmm. You've got to look beyond those, those points where things happen to us that are purifying us, that try our faith. And Ellen White points out in Desire of Ages that when the Lord endured the challenges that came to him in the garden, when he endured the test that came to him, his own crucible, on the day that he was about to be arrested, when the angel came and, and, and ministered to him in the difficult times of his life, he was able to recompose himself and face all of the challenges ahead of him with integrity, with dignity, not with fear at all. Mm -hmm. As he said to Peter, put away your sword. I got to call 12 legions <laughs> of angels. I did the math, James. That's more than 80,000 angels. Mm -hmm. What is one sword compared to 80,000 angels when one angel killed how many? 185,000. Right, right. The Lord could have turned that garden into a stadium of destruction. Mm. He says, P Peter, don't need your help. I could have called 80,000 angels. Mm. He didn't look at the cross as his destiny. Mm. He looked at the joy that was set before him. In every one of our crucibles, there is a character benefit. Look at some of the benefits. James 1, verse 3 and 4. Mm -hmm. James, James 1, verse 3 and 4, if you can get that for us. Mm -hmm. the, the benefits of the crucible. Here it is. James 1, 3 and 4? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That's right. And so when we look at that, that patience that comes in the difficult trials, it gets us to the place where we are mature. The word perfect there means mature in the Greek. Mm. And then we are complete in Christ. We're not lacking anything. Mm. And that is why when the Hebrews face the furnaces, what I enjoyed about that story, and I'm reminded when I go back to it every now and then, they didn't even consider, well, now should we go? Should we not go? Should we mm. bow? Should we not bow? Their minds were made up before the test came. Mm. Yeah. One of the best things we can do, because we know that these are certainties, these crucibles are certainties, we've got to make up, by, make up our minds long before the test comes what our reaction is going to be when the test comes. Mm -hmm. Revelation 3 and verse 10 is here is how it works. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world mm -hmm. to test those who dwell upon the earth. We will endure when the crucible comes to the world. Mm. Amen. Thank Amen. you for that foundation, John. I'm Shelley Quinn, and I have Monday's lesson, The Crucibles of Satan. I, the cosmic conflict that's going on in this world, the war between good and evil is mm. very real. Mm. Now, some people don't take Satan seriously. They see him as a cartoonish character with mm. the pitchfork and the little red tail and all. Mm. But God's word takes him very seriously. Mm. In the New Testament alone, Satan is mentioned 35 times and then Jesus uh, speaks of him a number of times as well. Satan is called the tempter, the ruler of demons, the god of this world, the prince of the powers of air, the ruler of the darkness of this age. He masquerades as an angel of light. He's the adversary, the evil one, the one who deceives, the accuser, the serpent, the dragon. Mm -hmm. Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning and the father of all lies. So we need to take Satan seriously. But on the flip side of that coin, some people give Satan too much credit. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. God operates by the power of love. Satan operates by the love of power. Mm -hmm. He wants to get the worship that's due to God. He wants to control, whereas God gives us free will. But here's the point that I want you to take home. Satan is a single being. He is not omnipotent. Mm. He is not omnipresent. Mm. You know, God is not threatened at all by Satan. 
And so what we've got to remember, even though Satan leads this allegiance, one third of the angels that were cast down, that followed him in rebellion, mm -hmm. even though he leads this rebellious group on the earth and there are demonic attacks, we just have to remember that they, God, Satan can tempt us, but he can't force us. Mm -hmm. First Corinthians 10, 13 promises us mm -hmm. that we, God will not allow us to be tempted beyond measure. He will always give us a way out. First John 4, 4 says, greater is he who is in you mm -hmm. than he who is in this world. Amen. So when you've got the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you can count on the fact uh, Colossians 2.15 said, Jesus already disarmed the principalities at the cross. He has defeated Satan and he will defeat him in your life as well. Okay, our study begins with 1 Peter 5.8. 1 Peter 5.8, Peter says, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Satan is on the prowl and his evil work on the earth, he wants, it's manifested in death and in destruction and mm. suffering. He twists God's word. He maligns God's character and he perverts the moral standards mm. of this world. When we were in Africa, we watched a lion who was going after an a gazelle. And what they do is they do everything they can. First, they go for the weak or the sickly, but the lion will separate the animal from the herd. That's the way they do this. See, Satan wants to separate you from your connection with God. Mm -hmm. He wants to separate you from your fellowship in the church. Mm -hmm. He is on the prowl, ready to attack. He wants to get your eyes on the problem and off the problem solver. Amen. So we need to take his plot seriously. Jesus said he comes to still kill and destroy. We need to take Satan seriously. Mm -hmm. We've got to be on the alert. And I have to say one thing. I'm so quick to recognize in somebody else's life, I'll say, you're going through a spiritual battle. Mm -hmm. This is a satanic attack. Mm -hmm. But when it happens to me, it's like, oh, Lord, what's wrong with me? What? <laughs> and then all of a sudden That's I true. wake up to the yeah. fact that, wow, I'm in a spiritual battle. This is a satanic attack. First Peter 5, 9 Peter continues, he says, resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same experiences, the same sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood mm. throughout the world. That's hey, right. did you know your fiery trial mm. may be a little bit different than mine, but it's somebody else in this world. Another believer is going through it. We have to stand up against the devil. And that's what James 4, 7 said. He says, submit to God. That means line up under his authority, under the authority of his word. It's a military term. Mm -hmm. Submit to his will, resist the devil. And guess what? He will flee from you. So we've got to give God our allegiance. And did you know what? You are either submitted to God or you're submitted to Satan. Mm -hmm. That's the only two places yeah. we can go, right? So put on the full armor of God, resist the devil. It takes a little energy, mm -hmm. an active mm -hmm. resistance to temptation. Mm -hmm. But First Peter 5, 10, he goes on, and here's God's promise to those who suffer. He says, may the God of all grace, mm -hmm. who is has called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After you have suffered a little while, may our God perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Mm -hmm. You can have confidence in God's loving care. Uh, when you were talking, I was thinking, wow, the crucible that we are in is the hand of God. Mm 
Mm. He's holding us in His hand. Mm -hmm. And if we turn to God, if we seek Him mm -hmm. and ask the Holy Spirit, He will help us to master sin. Sin won't be our master anymore, but we will reign through Christ Jesus in this life. And we have to remember, life is but a vapor. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. I was thinking the other day, you look at a tiny little ant. I don't know the lifespan of an ant, wow. but to him, mm -hmm. that life seems like it's a long time. Mm -hmm. And then we just go squish. Well, <laughs> did you know what? That's what the devil's trying to do to mm -hmm. us. Yeah. And we feel like we're in this eternal battle. But what God does is he uses our trials, our pain to purify us, mm -hmm. to conform mm -hmm. us to the image of Jesus. So when you are attacked, remember greater is he who's in me. God is working in you through your struggles to perfect you. Mm -hmm. he's, he's burning the dross off of your spiritual life. You'll mm. come out like pure gold. Yeah, he is faithful mm -hmm. to establish you firm in your faith. And you know what? Mm. Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you. Mm. My power is made perfect in weakness. So he promises to strengthen us mm -hmm. yeah. through these trials. And I love Zephaniah 317 that says that our mighty God will save us. He will quiet us mm -hmm. with his love. I love that. Mm -hmm. God mm -hmm. quiets us. He gives our hearts rest as we rest in his love. Mm -hmm. And it says he rejoices over us with singing. Is that your picture of God? Amen. When you're going through a trial, do you see God's everlasting arms wrapped around you? That the crucible, you're in the mighty hand of God. You know, sometimes we are delivered from our trials at some point during our life. But some people don't get released from their suffering till death. Mm. And we talked about Isaiah 57, 1, God sometimes takes the righteous, he lets the righteous die mm. to help them avoid evil. But when we get to heaven, you know what? God is promising us there'll be no more tears, mm. no more sorrow, That's right. no more pain, no more sighing over sin. And here's what the author of this work says, he said, Satan is at work in many ways. And although we must be aware of the reality and the power of our enemy, we must never be discouraged for we must always remember that Jesus has beaten Satan. Satan is a defeated foe. Right. And that as long as we stay connected with Jesus, clinging to him in faith, we can never be defeated either because of the cross. Christ's victory is ours. Amen. Amen. Thank you so Amen. much, Shelley. Thank you so much. We're just getting started on this lesson, uh, the crucibles that come, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Abian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3 Abian Sabbath School panel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Well, welcome back to our lesson study, lesson number two. And now we go to Jill on Tuesday, Crucibles of Sin. Thank you so much, Pastor John and Shelley. What an incredible study this is. I like what you said. It's practical, it's relevant, and it's what we need today. Mm -hmm. On um, Tuesday's lesson, we have crucibles of sin. And to be honest with you, my lesson's kind of heavy. We're going to be looking at Romans chapter 1. Mm. But before we get to Romans 1, I want to talk to you about if-then statements in light of the crucibles of sin. 
Now, if then statements are simply cause and effect statements, it's a conditional statement. Mm. If this happens, then this will happen. For instance, if you drive 75 miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour zone, likely then you will get a speeding ticket. If you smoke for 30 years, then there is a very good chance that you will develop lung cancer. If you go to a light switch and you flip it on, what's going to happen? Then the light comes on. But you know, if then statements apply in the Word of God. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of Exodus chapter 19. This is, of course, the Sinaitic Covenant. This is right before the Ten Commandments are given in Exodus chapter 20. And we see in Exodus 19, verse 5, If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. That's right. If you look at the spiritual if-then connection, if you sin, then you will die. We see that in Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. That's an if-then statement. If you sin, you die. But it doesn't stop there. Mm -hmm. It continues. If you accept God's gift of salvation, what happens? Then you will live. The gift of God is eternal life through mm -hmm. Jesus Christ, our Lord. 1 John 1, 9. If you confess your sins, what happens? Then you experience forgiveness and cleansing and redemption. That's right. Galatians 6, if you sow to the flesh, then you reap corruption. Mm -hmm. The contrast, if you sow to the spirit, then you reap eternal life. Mm. Proverbs 22, verse 8, if you sow iniquity, mm. then you will reap sorrow. Mm. 2 Corinthians 9, 6, if you sow sparingly, then you will reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, then you will reap bountifully. James 3, 18, if you sow peace, you will reap righteousness. Hosea 10, 12, if you sow righteousness, you will reap mercy. Mm. Hosea 8, 7, if you sow to the wind, you will reap mm. the whirlwind. So what are if-then statements, this cause and effect that we see in Scripture, what does that have to do with the crucible of sin? You cannot outwit God. You cannot dally with sin without expecting consequences. That's what we see in Romans mm -hmm. chapter 1. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at Romans 1. I've never looked at Romans 1 this way with the if-then principle intact. Mm -hmm. So let's look at it. Romans chapter 1, we're picking it up in verse 18. For the wrath of God, this is the judgment of God, that settled anger or opposition of God, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. God is literally, we see this in Romans 1, allowing humanity to reap what we have sown. Why is that? We experience the consequences of our action. Because God wants us to understand how deeply damaging sin is. Mm -hmm. How deeply offensive sin is to the heart and mind of God. Mm -hmm. So let's look at the if-then statements from Romans 1. We start in Romans 1 verse 21. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So if we refuse to recognize God, if we refuse to recognize Him as Creator, what happens? We become, then we become futile in our thoughts and our hearts and minds become darkened. Mm, wow. Futile in their thoughts is connected with idolatry in the Greek. And we're going to see this as we uh, see this list, this progression of sin. We see idolatry really come to the forefront. The next verse, Romans 1, 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Hmm. So what's our if-then connection here? If we claim to be wise right. in human understanding, if we follow psychology, if we follow evolution, if we follow humanism, mm. Mm. if we follow rationalism, if we follow secularism, if we follow new age beliefs, then we become fools. Mm. 
the next verse, verse 23, and change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. This is our if statement. If we substitute human creativity and false gods for the creator God's majesty, basically, if we indulge in idolatry, if we step into idolatry, right. what happens then, verse 24, then God will give them up to uncleanness and the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. So if we engage in this idolatry, then the consequences come. And we see this close connection begin to develop between idolatry mm -hmm. and sexual sin. God orchestrates events so that we see the if-then connection. We see the consequences work out of us walking into the crucible of sin. Let's keep going, verse 25. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. This is pantheism. If we engage in pantheism, if we worship the creature instead of the creator, mm. what happens? Verse 26 and 27. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful, receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. So we see again this connection between idolatry and sexual sin. Mm. We see immoral activity. We see homosexuality. We see fornication. We see bestiality. If we engage in unnatural sexual activities, the natural consequence is what? Disease and death. Mm. Mm. That is the crucible of sin. Right. That is the effect of the if-then crucible of sin. That's right. Verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. If we refuse to remember God, then we receive a debased and carnal mind. And there's a list of sins, which is incredible. Verses 29 through 31, unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. It's heavy. Backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. This is the then list mm -hmm. that happens mm -hmm. if we step into sin. The last then, the final then is verse 32. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also will approve of those who practice them. In other words, we know better. And not only do we not do what we know to be right, we approve and celebrate other people mm. who walk in wickedness. Wow. A Christian is to follow after God and encourage other people to follow God. Mm. The people in Romans 1, follow after sin mm -hmm. and encourage other people to step into the crucible of sin. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to leave you there. I want to leave you with hope. If you're in the crucible of sin right now, mm -hmm. if you are in the then consequences of the if where you stepped into sin, God doesn't have to leave you there. Know that the if then in the scripture applies to you. If you confess, he will forgive. He will cleanse and make you holy. Mm -hmm. If you give your heart to God, he will transform you yes. by the power of his spirit. You don't have to walk in the then consequences of sin because you can walk in the then consequences mm -hmm. of newness of life and restoration. Right. So make a choice if choose Jesus today. Mm. Amen. Thank you, Jill. Yes. Wow. This has been a powerful lesson. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right. My name is Ryan Day, and I have Wednesday's lesson entitled Crucibles of Purification. Wow. God wants to purify us. Mm. 
uh, God sometimes allows us to fall into these crucibles or experience these crucibles for the purpose of purifying us, for the purpose of setting us on the right path to redemption. And uh, I love the way this lesson kind of begins because it starts with a quote from one, in my, my, one of mine and Pastor Loma King's favorite writers, Oswald Chambers, uh, my utmost for his highest, page 271. Pastor, here's a sermon. Get ready for it. Okay. I love this. I love this quote because it's powerful. Uh, again, my utmost from his, for his highest, page 271. Notice what this says. If the Spirit of God brings to your mind a word of the Lord that hurts you, mm. you can be sure that there is something in you that he wants to hurt mm. to the point of its death. Mm. That's, That's right. That's powerful. That's right. That's powerful. It's not that God wants to hurt you, mm. but there's something in you that he wants to hurt to the point of its death. He wants to lay it on the altar and purge it from your life as we have learned, as we have seen so far. God is in the business of restoration. God is in the business of renovating doing an overhaul of your life in order to prepare us for heaven. And that's what this lesson, lesson uh, Wednesday's lesson, Crucibles for Pur Purification, is all about. We read from Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 7. We see uh, that through the history of Israel, we see that Israel's story is, is one of constant crucibles. Mm -hmm. And uh, we read there in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 7, speaking of the children of Israel, it says, Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will refine them and try them, mm -hmm. for how shall I deal with the daughter of my people. Now we're going to come back to this passage just, just a moment, but it's bringing out the fact that Israel's story, as I said, is one of constant crucibles. They were a stubborn and hardened of heart kind of people. They were very hardened of heart uh, that God had to go to the extremes in times, what we might consider extremes in times, in attempt to reach them. And you know, we are, are really no different. I hear people all the time sometimes say, well, you know, I'll read the story of Israel and I think to myself, how could these people not have followed God? How could these people not have believed and trusted in him after seeing all those mighty things? We ain't no different. Uh, we're, we're no different than them. We're just like Israel at times. And God has to put us or allow us to go through crucibles in order to get our attention as well. I, you know, the lesson brought out and was asking, you know, what are some of the crucibles or some of the moments in your life that you might have experienced? I remember early on in my experience, you know, I had one leg in the church and one leg in the world. And I was just, you know, I, I was a, a pastor's son and, the, you know, just kind of playing the role, putting on the mask at, at different times of whatever crowd I was around. And God wanted to get my attention. He saw, that he, he sees every single one of us. We are valuable to him and he will do every, anything. He will do everything he can to reach us. And he allowed me on two different occasions to end up in two different, on two separate occasions, emergency surgeries that almost claimed my life. Mm. And, and, uh, and he was trying to wake me up and shake me and say, son, I want to use you. I want to transform your life, but I need you to wake up and see your need of me. Mm. And, and he was able to do that. But I can tell you, does that mean the crucible stop once God has us? Mm. You know, even though we may profess our belief and profess our, our, our dedication to him and, and we now claim him as the Lord and Savior of our life, there are some character flaws in us that need to be burned out, that mm -hmm. need to be purged out. And so right. oftentimes, even along our path, as we're learning and as we're going to continue to learn in this study, God will allow us to fall into certain crucibles or to be tested, to be tried in order to prepare us and shape mm -hmm. and mold us as he is the potter and we are the clay. He's working on us to prepare us as vessels of honor for his kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for me, per, just just kind of you know, telling off on myself here. For me, I I, think, I actually think I've said this in a previous uh, uh, program. I have, I, I struggle with patience. That's my thing. Uh, you know, that's one of the fruits of the spirit. God wants us to have patience. Mm -hmm. I struggle in that area and I find myself, it's the story of my life. I find myself in crucibles that I hate to be in, mm -hmm. but I think God allows me to be in them often because he's wanting to say, Hey Ryan, here's an opportunity for you to learn patience. Mm -hmm. Just example, you know, long lines at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Oh Lord have mercy on me. Uh, you know, I'll sometimes go to Walmart and I'll find, I'll look for that short line and I'll think, Oh, no, no time for long lines today going to look for that short line and I'm perusing. I'll find the shortest line and think, ha ha, I'm going to get out for all these people. And I promise you every time the one I choose is the one where the, they have some type of electrical problem or some type of, you know, problem with something going on. And then I have to stand there longer and watch all the other lines that were longer than the one I chose. Keep going by, keep going by, keep going by. In those moments, I think those are moments where the Lord says, slow down, breathe, mm. have pa learn patience.
patience. You know, you, where are you, where are you hurrying off to? But yet that's, that's my, that's one of my flaws. Uh, whether it's behind slow drivers driving down the road, I used to speed and the Lord taught me not to speed, but even sometimes I'll get behind someone who's doing speed limit and think, oh, if you could just go five miles per hour, a little more, you know, a little bit faster. And I'm like, Ugh. you know, I'm not a honker or anything like that, but still I find myself saying, Lord, give me patience, Lord, help me. You know, God is preparing. And sometimes, sometimes the Lord will allow us to fall into crucibles, times of trying, times of testing. He will allow us to go through it. Not that it's his plan for this to happen, but sometimes the enemy, as we have learned, will place people in your life and around your life to test you. And God will allow you to go through that. And sometimes it comes from the brethren around you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it comes from your innermost, cir innermost circle that you may not perceive. And you will go through a testing and trying time, whether it be your character, your name, or whatever it is that, it, that you're going through. God will allow you to be tried. And that's what we're basically reading here in Jeremiah chapter 9. We're, we just read verse 7. We'll read that again. Jeremiah chapter 9. I'm going to read a few of these verses through to verse 16. We're not going to read the whole passage. But did, listen, just listen to how, I mean, this is, this is tough to read because God as the parent, he wants to reach his children, but they're just not getting it. Mm -hmm. And so now he has to sometimes take extreme measures to say, I will do what it takes to get you. I will do what it takes to redeem you. And so we see here in Jeremiah chapter 9 beginning with verse 7 we read it earlier but he says therefore thus says the Lord of hosts behold I will refine them and try them for how shall I deal with the daughter of my people and then on to verse 8 their tongue is an arrow shot out it speaks deceit one speaks peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth but in his heart he lies in wait mm. that's horrible and then verse 9 shall I not punish them for these things says the Lord shall I not avenge myself on such a nation as this skipping down to verse 11 he says I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins mm. a den of jackals I will make the cities of Judah desolate without an inhabitant mm. and then we go on down to verse 13 and the Lord said because they have forsaken my law which I set before them and have not obeyed my voice nor walked according to it but they have walked according to the dictates of their own hearts wow. and after the bales which their fathers taught them mm -hmm. verse 15 therefore thus says the Lord of hosts the God of Israel behold I will feed them this people with wormwood and give them water of gall to drink I will scatter them also among the Gentiles whom neither they nor their fathers have known. And I will send a sword after them until I have consumed them. You know, those are some harsh, difficult words to deal with right there. It seems right. from our perspective, it's like, man, God, calm down, right? It's okay. We're going to get through this. The Lord's like, no, because th this is, we're talking about more than 400, excuse me. Yes. More than 800 years at this point from the time of Mount Sinai all the way to this point. We're talking about more than 840 years of rebellion, mm. a constant rebellion. And God is just working with them, working with them, trying to prepare them for his original covenant intent, which for them to be the beacon of light to the rest of the world. But yet that is not the case. That's not what we're seeing here. God often allows us to fall in those trials. And sometimes he has to take extreme measures to receive us. And, and I, when I read this, this passage in Jeremiah chapter 9, I could remember back to my parents disciplining me mm. for as a child. Mm. You know, I, as an adult, I praise God for all those whoopings I got as a kid. <laughs> I am not one of those kids that, you know, growing up like, oh, you know, my parents abused me and they whipped me. You know, the truth of the matter is there's those kids that are good kids. Uh, you know, I think of the Vandervox kids, Liam, little Liam. He's such a good kid. I think he's received one whip in his whole life. I, I, it was, I was on a weekly basis. I was one of them kids that got whoopings on a weekly basis. I needed them. There's <laughs> other kids like Liam that don't need them, right? But the truth of the matter is God knows what we need. He knows that with some of us, he has to take extreme measures and with others, maybe not so much mm -hmm. because some of us listen and some of us don't. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is God wants to, he wants to prepare us. He wants to, uh, you know, he, he wants us to be prepared for his kingdom. Mm -hmm. He loves us. He doesn't want us to fall into these trials or be caught into by the snares of the enemy and float off into the abyss to where we're forever lost. He will go to the utmost, he will go forever, wherever he, wherever he can mm -hmm. to save us. That's why I love that song. Um, uh, the love, I love the worship song. 
uh, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, reckless love. I love that. Reckless love. Uh, there's no mountain you won't climb up. Um, let's see. No, no, there's no mountain you won't climb up. Mm-hmm. Shadow you won't mm, coming after me. I can't remember mm-hmm. the words. But anyways, mm-hmm. there's no wall you won't kick down. Mm-hmm. Lie you won't tear down. Mm-hmm. Coming after me. God is coming after you. He is, he is seeking you. Mm-hmm. He is running for you. He wants to win your heart and he will do all that he can, even if it means to purify the your purification mm-hmm. means to be brought about by a crucible, then he would allow us to go into that for sure. Amen. 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 Absolutely. Amen. Thank you, Ryan. That, yeah, that's so powerful. You know, the, the issue is trusting God. My name is James Raffrey and I have the Thursday's lesson, which is crucibles of maturity. And it's this idea that we come to a place where we actually start trusting God. We start trusting God in the crucibles that we go through. And Paul came to that place. We're looking in uh, Thursday's lesson at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to be looking at verses 7 through verse uh, 10. But we'll just start with verse 7. It says here, lest and lest I should be exalted above my measure, or above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. And he emphasizes that twice. He tells us why this is happening. And that is the crucible of maturity. The crucible mm-hmm. of maturity is, is when you come to the place where you no longer say, why is this happening to me? <laughs> How come this is you know, my experience? If the Lord is leading me, what in the world? You say, lest I should be exalted above measure. Let me repeat that now. Lest I should be exalted above measure. That's why God has allowed this to happen. Mm-hmm. And it really is powerful because when you think about uh, maturity, when you think about faith, I remember a preacher once said, Uh, talking to someone who was sick and they wanted prayer for healing and the preacher asked the question, do do you have enough faith not to be healed? Mm. Mm. Where is your level of maturity? You know, Elisha died of a terrible sickness, we're told in 2 Kings chapter 13 and verse 14. He had um, uh, the faith not to be healed. He still kept his trust in God. He was faithful to the very end. In fact, he was in ministry to the very end. Yeah. That's right. He was actually ministering to the king and encouraging his faith. Hey, hit those arrows on the ground seven, eight, nine <laughs> times, not just two or three times. Right. And this is while he's dying of a terrible disease. So, you know, when you, when you think about, for example, gardening, we're uh, developing an orchard right now and we, you know, you get out there and you, you plant the trees, and then of course you prune them up. And there's a big difference between pruning a tree and cutting a tree down, mm. you know. The Bible talks about in, in John chapter 15, Jesus talks about pruning us. Yeah. And the reason why he's pruning us is because he doesn't want us to be cut off. Right. You see, the Bible talk, uses that phrase, you know, cut off mm-hmm. to, to describe the lost, those who eventually turn away from God, who are eventually uprooted, who eventually are no longer in the kingdom of God. So we want to allow God to develop greater fruitfulness. He, we want to allow Him to prune us, to grow us, to develop us. And that's the purpose that God has for us, and that is the crucible of maturity that we are to come to. Now, people have wondered, what was Paul's issue anyway? You know, he prayed uh, more than once. He prayed, you know, that God would remove this thorn out of his flesh. Well, what was this thorn in his flesh that's talked about here in 2 Corinthians 12, 7? You know, and ideas range from, you know, Paul's having constant attacks uh, from his enemies to having his speech difficulty. Um, but it seems that this was actually a problem with his eyesight. In fact, in, in Galatians, he talks about how he wrote a large letter. And if you look at the Greek there, it's actually large in character, a large letter by his own hand, uh, that he had this issue from the time that he was converted. Right. You know, when Christ met him on the road to Damascus, and of course he couldn't see at all, and then his eyesight was restored, but it was still, there was still a weakness there. Mm-hmm. And I think about how God allows us to have these weaknesses, sometimes from the very beginning of our ministry. We have these areas where God doesn't fully remove them because he knows we need them to help keep us dependent on him. Paul says it was given to him. Well, who gave it to him? (laughs) Now, of course, Paul went through all kinds of trials. Satan buffeted him and came after him, and the text tells us that. So I think that it was larger than this, just his eyesight. And we recognize that even when we go through these trials, that God is superseding. God is superintending. You know, nothing comes to us but through Jesus. You know, we're told in Romans chapter 8 that 
all things work together for good. Right. Now, it doesn't mean everything that happens to us is God's will, but He will overrule those things. He will bring good out of those things. And this is what we find with Paul. And it's really significant because when you look at the big picture, well, let's just look at, at, the, at the verses themselves. Let's just start, well, we've read verse 7. But let's just start there again. Let's just read all the way through verse 10 and try to get in the big picture of what's happening here. 2 Corinthians chapter, um, chapter what? Chapter 12, verses, mm -hmm. verses 7 through 10. And lest I should be exalted above measure, there it is, through the abundance of the revelations, in other words, through the way God has been using me, right? There was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, I just want to stop there for a second. Beyond his eyesight, Paul went through all kinds of trials and tribulations. You know, it's not just right. one thing mm -hmm. in our lives. There are many things that come at us. I remember 20 years ago in 2003, I was diagnosed with, with cancer. And it was overwhelming. It was so dark that I felt like I was just going down and couldn't get out. I remember there was a pastor friend who lived in Seattle a young man that had been at our camp meeting. We'd been working out together down in the basement, just kind of connecting. And he found out about the situation. He found out that I was going to have an anointing on a Friday evening. And he drove from Seattle five hours away. He drove over that Friday uh, for this anointing service. And then he had to preach the next morning. Then he turned around and he drove back to his church. I think, I think his love, his sacrifice of travel his desire to be there for me at that time was more healing than almost anything else. Mm, just, the, wow. just the service that he, that he, it told me that God loves me. God put the spirit in his heart to do that act of service. Mm -hmm. And that told me God still cared about me. God works through people. He works through human beings to reach out to, to the afflicted, to those who are going through trials. He wants to encourage us. And when I went through this trial with cancer, I remember people saying to me, well, what did you do? And how come you, did you eat something? What's up with your diet? This, that, and the other. And other people said to me, you know, James, we just want you to know that we love you, that God loves you, and we're praying for you. We love you, God loves you, and we're praying for you. And that meant everything to me. And I think that is so important for people to hear those words from other human beings who are connected with God because it's as though God is speaking to us through those human beings. And then he goes on in verse 8, he says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, he says, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. See, this is the crucible of maturity in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, this maturity is almost overwhelming if you're not there yet. And I know in my own experience, mm -hmm. I've struggled. You know, in, in times of trial, you struggle and you think, oh, I don't know if I can get through this. You know, I'm not yeah. sure. Uh, right. Maybe this is my fault. Maybe this is an experience that, that I brought upon myself and maybe is it possible I'm going to get through this? But when I think about the experience of maturity, this crucible of maturity, I think about, I can't help but think about the experience of Daniel's chapter 4. Excuse me, Daniel chapter 4. It's actually not uh, a chapter that Daniel wrote. It's a chapter that Nebuchadnezzar wrote. Right. <laughs> and, and I just want to highlight a couple of thoughts here uh, in this chapter. There, just toward the end, we know the story a little bit. For those of you who don't, Nebuchadnezzar is king of Babylon. God is bringing through him through a crucible of maturity, okay? And it's intense, like it's a seven-year timeout. That was the one thing my daughter hated it, when it came to discipline was timeout. She liked to talk. She liked to communicate. You could give her a spanking, wouldn't touch her. Timeout, oh, that was like... <laughs> and so Nebuchadnezzar is put on a seven-year timeout. He loses his mind for seven years. He's not saying anything. He's not doing anything. He's been removed from office. He's like a wild man, right? When he gets out of all this experience that God is using through a crucible of maturity, this is what he says, verse 34. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven. And my understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and I honored Him. What? What? Mm. He's just caused you to be a wild man, to lose everything you have on planet Earth for seven years, and you're blessing Him and you're praising Him? That is a converted man. That is mm, yes. the crucible 
of maturity. Mm. And we, we, God is bringing us to this place ourselves because see, the whole, the whole issue with us is self-exaltation. You know, Paul, that's what Paul is emphasizing twice there in verse seven, lest I be exalted. The, the issue with Lucifer, the issue with Eve, the issue with Cain, the issue with Saul, the issue with David, the issue with Solomon, the issue with all of God's people, the Pharisees, the disciples, the early church, the Laodicean church, you know, rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. The, the inclination to self-exaltation is natural but it's carnal. You know, Paul was dealing with this in Corinthians. You know, one says you're of Apollos, another says you're of Paul, another says you're of P Peter, and we're all of Christ. You know, Daniel himself, you know, says, Arioch says, I found a man, and Nebuchadnezzar says, are you the one? And Daniel says, no one of your wise men can do this, but there is a God in heaven. <laughs> Completely right. e mm -hmm. eclipses himself, and that's what God wants to bring us. You know, in the book of Revelation, we have the same revelation. You know, John falls down before the angel in Revelation 19:10 and, and begins to worship. And the angel's like, no, 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 don't, 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 do not do that. You, you can imagine, he's thinking back, as it says in a little devotional this day with God, you know, to Lucifer's fall, because some of the angels actually in less exalted positions in heaven thought that Lucifer was the ruler in heaven, the God of heaven. And so he's saying, no, no, don't do this. I'm your fellow servant. Worship God. God gets all the glory. God gets all the praise. God alone is worthy of our worship, and we can trust him in the crucible of maturity. Amen. Wow, thank you, James. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Shelley. Shelley, some closing thoughts. I don't know if this even connects, but what was just going through my mind is what Satan tries to get us to do, as he did with Adam and Eve, is to declare our independence of God. Mm -hmm. That's the root of sin. Mm -hmm. So I want to encourage you to depend on God, mm -hmm. to get you through it all. Mm -hmm. Hold on to him, submit to God, and he will strengthen you. Amen. Amen. This has been an amazing study. And if you are in the midst of a crucible of sin, there is hope. You don't have to stay there or be stuck there, but God wants to bring you out. Mm -hmm. Amen. I kind of butchered the lyrics to Reckless Love earlier. And as the pro program progressed along, I remembered them. Mm. Uh, there's no shadow you won't light up. Mm. mountain you won't climb up coming after me. Mm -hmm. There's no wall you won't kick down, mm -hmm. light you, lie you won't tear down coming after me. God is mm -hmm. after us mm -hmm. and he wants to save us and he will do anything he can to reach us at this time. Amen, amen. And we can trust God. We're going to go, th go through some crucibles and they're for us, they're for our protection, they're to help us to put our trust fully and completely in Jesus Christ as the only one who can take us through the, the difficulties and the challenges of this earth. So learn to trust Jesus in that crucible of maturity. Amen. Oh, well, thank you all for the crucibles that we mm -hmm. talked about and we are praying for the crucible that you may be going through. There's a passage in scripture I was gonna use, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, but that was wonderful that James talked about that boasting in our infirmities, but Isaiah 43, 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you mm -hmm. and through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. And I'll add my part, but you will be purified. Mm -hmm. So may God bless you as you go through the crucibles of life, knowing that the Lord is working out your best at the end of the journey, at the end of the fire, at the end of the water. We look forward to seeing you for the next lesson, lesson number three, entitled Birdcage. And we look forward to seeing you then. God bless you.